Hi, so I like to start with this slide because I think it's pretty inspirational. <laughs> like if that cat can ride bacon through space, we can do anything, you guys. <laughs> That's usually way funnier. Anyway, hi. Um, <laughs> I'm Cap, um, I'm the VP of design at BuzzFeed, um, where we make cool things like uh, our CSS framework solid. Um, this is a design system conference, so I felt like I could one slide talking about design systems, and this is the only slide that I'll be talking about design systems in. <laughs> um, I also spend time making charts that apparently are relevant to this crowd's interests. Um, <laughs> who was here? Did that, yeah. Who was here last year? Just a few of you. Well, so last year I didn't get to come to this conference, um, and I was pretty bummed about not being able to be there. But while I was sitting in the office and all of a sudden I started getting tweets from this conference, um, so like this one from Gina, uh, apparently that chart kept making its way into people's talks. Um, apparently upwards of six times last year, <laughs> which was cool, uh, except I never thought would, that my legacy would be a scale of fucks. I didn't think that would be it. Actually, it's really messed up. I was at home with my parents uh, the last couple days and my dad brought up this scale, <laughs> which I have mixed feelings about. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but anyway. So I'm not here to talk about solid or that scale. Um, I wanted to talk about something else. Um, so as the VP of design at BuzzFeed, I, you know, I wind up giving talks like this uh, uh, pretty frequently, like participating in panels and stuff like that. And for a while now, I've noticed the same question frequently comes up. Um, and it's something like this, like what's being VP of design like? Um, or another way of framing it might be, you know, what's a typical day like for you? And you know, you get asked this enough um, that it starts to feel like that scene in office space where they're trying to decide if you should still work there or not. Um, and the problem is that like my answer to those questions are really bad. It's, the, it's always the same, which is, depends. Um, on the day, on the week, um, on the quarter, it all depends, like my job changes a lot. So I got tired of like giving this answer to people. It feels kind of crappy. So I decided that I would make a talk where I just show everybody what it's like. And you're all designers, so I need to prepare you emotionally. There's some things that you're going to be sad about, probably. Um, the first of which, uh, so I wanted to show you first my desk. Just kidding, that's not my desk. This is my desk. <laughs> that last one was Jeff Sheldon from UG Monk, and uh, I call bullshit on that desk. Uh, <laughs> So this is not stage. I decided to just like take a photo of my desk for this talk, and I just did it at that exact moment. So let's walk you through the disaster area of my desk. So, <laughs> so the first thing is I have a textbook on facilitation that I've been reading. Uh, I run this thing at BuzzFeed called Manager Dens, uh, where we have managers get together as like kind of like small manager support groups each every couple of weeks, and they can talk about stuff. Um, but I was reading this book on facilitate, this textbook on facilitation, highlighting things, putting post-it notes in. I thought I was done with that um, after college, but apparently I'm not. Uh, there's a book on color theory I'm rereading, which is pretty dope. Uh, birthday cards that I tend to keep, because um, they're nice. I have my own set of cards that say, I, I owe you my firstborn. I, <laughs> I give these to like people who help our team out, so like particularly folks in HR and finance because I want them to be on our side when we need stuff. Um, and it kind of works, so I highly recommend giving nice cards to HR and finance. Um, there's a bobblehead of myself that I was given at a conference as a speaker gift that's just too weird to take home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's also a running joke that I could take these to my one-on-ones and it'd be about the same. <laughs> uh, and then there's a receipt for uh, an outing with the team that I probably should at some point uh, expense. Um, the aforementioned finance people, um, so they don't get on me about that. So that's my desk. Um, and the other terrifying thing I like to show people uh, is my calendar. So this isn't even everything, right? This is, a two, this is on Tuesday, obviously, afternoon. Stuff's gonna get added to it throughout the week. Um, uh, I, I'm constantly pruning this thing. I'm always thinking about like, what should, where should I be? Like, what should I be doing with my time? Um, and actually, this is a weird hack, but I leave stuff on here that, uh, that I don't actually have to go to so I can just like not go and have my time back. Um, and then people won't book over it. Oh, the other cool hack, this is not just for managers. I set my calendar to private on purpose because I had this situation once where somebody booked over 
um, something else, and I asked them, like, I told them, no, I can't do that, and they said, well, that other thing is not as important. Um, this has probably happened to more people than just me, and so I set it to private so that they can never tell <laughs> what's important or not. Um, so anyway, so people see this. I mean, you know, people at BuzzFeed, you know, turn on my calendar to try to schedule something, and it's always the same reaction, like, what the hell? Um, what is on that calendar? <laughs> And so I actually went through and I tallied up everything that was on this calendar um, in that week. Um, and so I'm going to share that with you. So I had two design critiques. They're an hour and a half each. They're on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They're the full team. Um, we break them down into, like, the team's big enough now. We break it into small groups. Uh, and they all meet together and we critique work together. Um, I had three team lead meetings, and so, so I manage design managers. Um, I have a meeting with those folks every Monday to go over like tactically where we're at with the team, what we should be like digging into, and what we should be thinking about. Uh, I have a meeting with my level of people, so like all the VPs in, te in the technology department meet every week um, with our boss, and we talk through like you know what's going on with tech. Um, talk about like strategic issues and stuff like that. And then the third team lead meeting, I don't have anymore, but I was for a couple of years running the IT team at BuzzFeed, which makes total sense. Um, <laughs> we can talk about that some other time. But, uh, but I was meeting with those managers too every week to kind of like, again, like just assess the health of the team and make sure that we're all like on the right track. That week was also mid-year review week, so I was delivering five mid-year reviews. Um, so that takes up time, obviously, for you know, prepping, planning, um, delivering the review, so that was that was all encompassed here. Um, product strategy meetings, so the different teams will meet with the executive team on whatever cadence they think is useful to them um, to ask us questions, get help, that kind of thing. Um, and so I had five of those this week. They're about an hour long. I had nine recruiting meetings. So at BuzzFeed, we don't use recruiters. Um, we do all of our own sourcing, all of our own, like, we, we set up the interviews uh, almost all the way through. Uh, and so that requires a lot of time. So there's like coffee meetings in here, there's Google Hangouts, there are like in-person interviews um, in the office, that kind of thing all in here. So especially during the times that we're recruiting the most, this number goes way up um, and takes up a lot of time for me and a few other people. I had 14 one-on-ones that week. Um, I don't manage 14 people. <laughs> I manage five people. Um, but, uh, but I wind up having one-on-ones with people that I think I should, um, just like product managers, uh, engineers, people like that, that like I feel like it would be good to keep up with. There's also a few people that I'm like actively kind of mentoring in the organization, so they, you know, those people pop through here as well. And so there was one other thing on my calendar, it wasn't on my calendar actually, but I noticed was taking up a lot of my time. Um, and so I decided to count that too. Uh, so during that week, that particular week, I had 15 moments where I was afraid. And this is where the, it takes a dark turn. Um, and so I actually sat down and I wrote down every time that week that I had like a, a worry or I, was, uh, I had a fear of something. Um, and so there were things like, am I doing a good job? I think we all, you know, everyone probably identify with that. Am I doing what I said I would? Uh, I really value this. I think if I say I'm going to do something, I should do it, and I should do it well. Um, and so this is something I worry about a lot. Is this thing I'm doing the best it could possibly be? Am I delivering what someone else would expect from me? Um, and so I think about this. Are people on my team happy? Uh, I want to make sure people are going to stick around. Um, those, recruiting me those recruiting meetings are fun, but they're not that fun. Uh, I'd rather do fewer of those. And so like, I want to make sure that uh, people on my team are feeling challenged, that they're, they feel like they're working on things that are important, um, and that they have autonomy to do like great work. And so I think about this. Um, what if this person quits? <laughs> this is my like deep down dark fear, uh, where even if nothing, everything seems great, I always like am worried that someone is like unhappy or thinking about leaving. Um, like, and then it starts to cascade, right? Like, what would we do if someone quit? Holy crap! Like, how would we fill it? Um, how can I make more time to do more of those recruiting meetings? Like, what would I ha have to give up? Like, what would that, you know, what would that look like? What if we hire the wrong person? Oh my God, how would that affect the team? Um, these are really important things. Like, you, especially when you're interviewing people, you're just going, you're kind of in the background going like, if we hired this person, like, would that, you know, is there something I'm not seeing that would be toxic to the team or like would harm the other, like the team in any way? <laughs> this is always a fun one. I feel like I'm forgetting something. <laughs> And then the quick follow-up fear, which is, what am I forgetting? <laughs> you have that, you know, you're like sitting there and you're doing something, and you're like, wait, I was supposed to do something today. I don't remember what it was. 
Um, and then you check your to-do list because you're sure you wrote it down and you don't feel like you did. It's terrible. Uh, did I choose the right meeting to go to? This is a weird manager one, um, but like I said, that calendar is crazy, and I want to be in the most high leverage meetings I can possibly be in. Like, I should not be in places where I'm not adding, like, value. Uh, and I always wonder, especially when I make trade-offs about, like, I'm going to go to this product review instead of, you know, this, like, design critique today. Like, that's, like, a choice I have to make, and I'm not sure ever it's the right one. Because it was review week, um, of evaluating people fairly. Um, we have a pretty robust um, role documentation and like way of evaluating people, but like this is always something I'm worried about. I want to make sure that like the reviews I'm giving people and the way we're evaluating them feel um, reasonable and fair and based on you know factual information as much as possible. Um, am I even being helpful? Uh, you know, in the meetings or in one-on-ones, you know, I'm giving advice to people. I'm giving design critique to people. Um, I'm giving guidance to teams, like, and, and I just don't ever know. Sometimes you just can't tell um, if you're being helpful or not. I think it's really dark. Am I useful? Do I even matter? <laughs> it's real bad, you guys. <laughs> it's a bad week. <laughs> um, and I'm all the way back around on Friday. I had the same first, like, the same thought I kicked off my week with. Um, am I doing a good job or not? So that's 15 times. That's 50, it's three times a day um, that I've considered one of these questions. This happened to me more than any other meeting I had um, or any interaction I had. And I think a lot of people have fears that are similar to mine. Um, like, who here worries about anything like this, like with any frequency? You didn't raise your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> um, and I've been thinking a lot about it lately and how we all try, like, we all try to act like we don't feel this way. Like, this is like, we're not supposed to actually share this. I'm not supposed to be telling you that this stuff is how I feel. Um, I'm actually not even sure that people that I work with think that I feel this way about things. I don't think someone's sitting there staring at me going like, man, Cap must be really worried about blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't think they think about that. And I don't know if that's whether it's like, due to my job, you know, or how I present myself to people, or online, or that I, you know, in these conference talks, or whatever. Um, so I wanted to take an opportunity to talk about the fear and how I've learned to cope with it. <laughs> I gave this talk recently, and no one got this gif, you guys. <laughs> that conference sucked. Um, <laughs> this one's way better. <laughs> So a few years ago, um, about five years ago, I started working at Etsy. And at Etsy, it's standard practice uh, that everyone in the product development org can deploy uh, the entire website anytime. Like, there's just a button. You can go. You can push it. It deploys everything. Um, that, and that includes designers. Uh, so I had deployed before, like not at Etsy, but at other places. But these were like, I had deployed at small startups with not that many users and not that much at stake. If I took the whole site down, it didn't matter um, because we were still pretty early in those days. Um, but at Etsy, we're talking about millions of people spending hundreds of millions at the time and eventually like billions of dollars um, on this website. So if you mess it up, like if you take the site down for an hour, that's a big deal. Um, so that was very terrifying to me um, as a designer. Like what if I screwed up? You know, what if I cost the company a lot of money um, with a bad deploy and that hurt our sellers um, or like prevented our buyers from finding stuff? Um, and I was playing it cool on the outside, like I knew it was up, but I was definitely worried. And I, was, I would do this thing where I would wrap my deploy in someone else's deploy so that they would do it. So they'd push the button. Um, and I would check it afterwards, but it'd kind of be up to them to do it. And so I, eventually I realized I couldn't keep going like this. And so I talked to a friend of mine, Mike, who is way less terrifying than this photo, and he'd be very upset if he knew it was this big on screen at the Alamo Draft House. <laughs> but Mike had worked at companies similar to Etsy that had similar deploy processes. I think he was, he'd been working at Flickr at the time, um, or right before that, where they did something similar. And I asked him, I told him about like, the, the fear I had of hitting that button. Um, and I asked him how I could get more confident um, about pushing it. And he told me something that really surprised me. It was contrary to what I thought was true, which was you should, he said you should never deploy without the fear. Um, because to him, like the fear meant that you were going to check your work. Um, you're going to have someone else check your work. Um, you'll get another opinion on your PR. Um, you'll do one more pass to make sure everything's correct. 
Um, and it means you're more likely to catch mistakes before they go out. And in fact, like after I thought about that some more, I realized the other th true thing is that being totally confident is way more dangerous than being a little bit afraid. Um, there's actually nothing that worries me more than hearing someone talk about something in a way that makes like, that sounds like they have it exactly correct, or that they know exactly what they're doing. Like that attitude, I think, um, blinds people to sometimes even enormous holes in their worldview. Um, and you can see this over and over again um, in the real world. So here's a really famous example that hopefully will become familiar to everybody um, of someone who uh, had a gigantic hole, I almost said ginormous hole. <laughs> I do this professionally. Um, oh, well we tried. Now all my slides are on. Steve, let me ask you about uh, the iPhone and the Zune, if, if I may. The Zune uh, was getting some traction, then Steve Jobs goes to Macworld, and he, he pulls out this iPhone. What was your first reaction when you saw that? <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. No fear. <laughs> we see how that turned out. I, I guess he owns a basketball team, so he's probably fine. Um, so yeah, so like enormous hole, right? Like just did not even think that this was like a um, But to bring it a little closer to home, maybe like this is kind of out there. To bring it a little closer to home, I wanted to talk about a time I fucked up. Um, <laughs> we'll go one more time. I, I like how sad how sad she is after. <laughs> like she can tell she just knows. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. We lost, right? We lost. I know we did. <laughs> so I was working on um, at the time I was working on as at Etsy, working on revamping our item review system, um, like the system people use uh, when they receive something, they could rate it and rate their interaction with the seller and stuff like that. Um, and it was a really sensitive topic with our community. The, the product itself was extremely broken. Like, it did not work um, for anybody. It was actually a really toxic product. Um, but it was the product that the selling community knew, and they understood it, and they understood how to, like, I don't know, game it's a strong word, but they knew how to use it in a way that was advantageous to them. Um, and so any change that we had ever proposed to make that system more fair had been met, like, with a lot of resistance. And so... We were going to propose an enormous overhaul of this entire system. And so we were trying to keep it kind of quiet while we worked on it so that we can control the communication, you know, roll it out in a, in a way that made sense for the community. Um, and so I'm sitting there, I'm on this team, and I'm working on the projects. I'm writing some code to like build out the UI um, in a very static way. Um, and so I'm like, you know, I'm writing my code. I get it to a place I feel good about. I commit, I push, I deploy. I'm, I think I'm behind a feature flag, which if you don't know is like um, a bit of code that you wrap your code in and it makes it so only you can see it in production, and so like no one else can. Um, and so I'm like, I'm behind a feature flag, no problem, boom, deploy, go to lunch. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. Uh, I come back from lunch and I have a ton of email and a ton of IRC messages. Um, yes, we used IRC, Slack didn't exist. Um, and Everyone was like, did we launch this feature? Because it's there. <laughs> I was like, uh, and I went and looked, and there it was. It was live for everybody. 100% uh, of people could see this static UI that didn't really work, but definitely showed what we were planning to do. Um, <laughs> and the forums, like there's threads in the forums. Sellers have seen it now, and they're like, oh my god, they're moving to star ratings, and, rah, and they're all freaking out. Um, and I'm like frantically, you know, like, working with an engineer and we like wrap it up in code the way we should have and like you ship it and like turn it off. And I'm sitting there like just like mortified and I look up and Mark Headland, who was the VP of engineering and product at the time, I see him stand up from his desk and walk towards me like that slow motion walk in your head, right? You're like, I was, I hadn't been there that long. I was like, oh my God, I'm fired. Like this is, <laughs> this is happening right now. And he gets up to me and he breaks in this huge smile and he goes, so, one of us, huh? <laughs> and 
And I realized at that moment, like I would never do that again. Like I would always, I would, I would be way more careful with my deploys and I would make sure that someone checked it with me um, before I went out. But that was amazing to me. And actually, like he kind of in that moment admitted to me that like he had also done stuff like this and that it was okay. Um, that he, like, that the fear was real for all of us. And that's when I realized that every successful person has the fear. Um, like, here was the VP of Product and Eng admitting to me that basically he did this stuff too. Um, and my boss, actually, uh, Dow Nguyen, who runs the technology team at BuzzFeed and now also a big chunk of the business team, um, she talks to me regularly about things she's worried about or concerned about um, or like uncertainty she has about decisions that she's making. Um, and that's really hard to do, I'm sure. And it, but it's really formative for me as someone who reports to her. Um, it, she's like an amazing role model in that way um, because she can talk to me about those things and it makes me realize that like I don't have to be perfect either. It's okay for me to share the, my fears and concerns with her um, and with others as well. But then like this, this whole thing starts to generate the question, right? If I'm supposed to be afraid, <laughs> what about confidence, right? Um, don't leaders need confidence if they're going to lead teams? Um, doesn't everyone tell you that's advice people get or that's like feedback people get. It's like you need to be more confident. You should be more assertive. And I think what people fail to mention when they give that, so they give that feedback, um, is that fear, that, that fear is in itself a, a part of being confident. Um, confidence that you're fallible, that you're human, that like you might miss something or forget something. Um, and when you know that about yourself, like when you are aware that that's possible and you have that fear, you can start to mitigate it by being more open um, and transparent about the things you might mess up or the things that you need to reverse. Um, and unintuitively, maybe, like, being afraid builds trust with other people. Um, knowing if other people know that you're uncertain about something, it makes you more approachable when things aren't quite right. So, for instance, when I first started at BuzzFeed, I had zero trust with the design team. Like, they didn't know me. I was coming in right. Like, I was definitely going to make some changes. Um, they didn't know what those changes would be. Um, but were there going to be changes to how we worked, expectations of design, uh, a lot of other stuff. And I was definitely also concerned that the stuff I was going to try, I mean, these were, these were things that I had done before and had success with, but they might not work in the context of BuzzFeed um, with the team I had. And so I was worried that maybe we would try stuff and it would blow up. So when I talked to the team in the very first week, um, I, gave them this, I gave them this deck um, that was kind of like what to expect, like what was going to change, what we were going to try. And then this section of my notes, you don't need to read it, but basically, I told them in the very end, I was like, if you see something wrong, let me know. If something we're trying isn't working, let me know. If you think there's a way we can make things better that we're not doing, also please let me know. Like, I kept telling them, and I've told them for now three years, everything we're doing is an evolution. Like, it's okay to like point out something that I implemented that isn't working. In fact, please do, because otherwise we're going to sit with this stupid thing forever, and everyone's going to be sad. Um, and they do. They tell me when things aren't working. And they actually now even proactively will go out and try new solutions on their own in smaller ways and then come back and say, like, this thing is working. Uh, I think more people should do it. I think that's really cool, and it helps us. I mean, it helps me not be like solo responsible for making everything amazing. Another example of embracing the fear has been the product design roles. Um, so we, um, for the last three years, I've been uh, working on this document with, with the managers at BuzzFeed, and we iterate on it every single year. We change it every year. Um, and sometimes those mean big changes, like from year one to year two, uh, it was a huge rewrite. Um, and from year two to year three, I did a much smaller revision based on feedback. Um, but I think what happens a lot of the time with these documents is that people write them, like managers write them in a silo. Maybe they show them to managers or something, and then they ship it. And then they never touch it again, and they never think about it. Um, and when writing this, I think it'd be really easy to do that. By the way, this is all, I, we open source these documents, um, and you can find them on GitHub. Um, I don't have the URL in this deck, but it's just github.com slash buzzfeed slash design. It's here with a few other things. You can feel free to just take it and do whatever you want with it. Um, but when I write these now, any time I've written one of these or revised it, I always send it to the team 
before we finish it, before it's done. Um, and I usually send it in an email that looks like this, um, which I'll stop and let you all read. I'm just kidding, don't do that. Uh, but I get feedback. Um, and this is the graph that really is the one that I think matters here. Like, I am admitting that this might not be perfect, uh, that I need them to read it and tell me if something's too vague, if they disagree with something, if something's antithetical to the way they think we should be working, um, because we should fix it before we codify it. And the reason I do this is like, first of all, again, I'm afraid that I might be wrong or be missing something. Um, but the other thing is like they know so much more than I do about this document because they're the ones that have to live with it. They have to be like evaluated by it. They all think about it. They set goals by it. Like they have a lot more interactions with this than I do. So they're in a much better position. And so if I went away and just wrote it in a silo and was so confident and shipped it, like it would not work for them uh, in a lot of ways, I'm sure. And I got a ton of feedback um, about this document and it makes it better. And then the last example of stuff we do, or that I do to kind of counteract this fear and how to cope with it, um, this is my way of dealing with my biggest fears every year, is I have an offsite with some of the product design team where I basically like make an entire day about stuff I'm worried about. Um, <laughs> make a list, and I'm like, these are the five things, the five biggest things that are on my mind um, that I'm worried about, and I invite a mix of managers and senior product designers um, to come, and they, we just talk through it, and we reevaluate things we're doing. Um, so things I wanted to address, are we promoting people in a fair and justifiable way? Like, do we have a rubric for doing this and knowing when to promote people? Um, is the way we're setting goals useful for people? Is it consistent? Does it need to be consistent? I don't know. Um, they're not consistent now. Should they be? These are questions I have. Um, We've addressed things like our hiring practices. I think they're pretty good, but we, you know, perfection's a pursuit, and I'm sure they're not as great as they could be. And so we talk about those, um, particularly with the newer people, and so they can tell us about their experience. Um, and then the last thing that we talked about in this particular one this year was um, I realized we had no way, no like codified way of training people um, on specific design skills, which as we hire more junior folks will be more and more important. And so we wanted to talk about like how we might address that um, going forward. So we've held this offsite for two years, um, and it's awesome. Uh, it lets me just like go like, here's all this stuff that I've been thinking about and worrying about and not knowing it's just too big for me to do by myself, um, and get people in a room and get them to help me. Um, and it's really great. It's made the team a lot better. We always wind up presenting all, this is the deck we present to the team at the end, where it's like, here's everything we talked about. Here's everything that came out of it. Here's what you can expect um, going forward to change or not. Um, and again, it's far better than if I was just sitting there trying to improve the team on my own. The team is better because I'm a little afraid um, and I need their help. So I guess like to summarize, the fear, it turns out, makes you better. And I think it makes your relationships better too. Um, and in the end, the way, uh, I think it's more accurate to describe these like 15 fearful thoughts or these little moments I'm having as thoughtful moments. You can see, and now it, it's nice again. Uh, <laughs> so when you experience the fear, like I think we're all, we all have these moments, we all like have these like, concerns and worries. Just remember that it's, that's a reminder to you, to be thoughtful about what you're doing, um, to take another look at it, to get a second opinion from somebody or from a bunch of people, um, to take risks but with care um, and make sure that you're being uh, mindful about what you're doing. And it's reminding you to be a better collaborator, like a better coworker, and a better human being. Thank you. We'll get up and get some exercise, and <laughs> I'm into it. Um, okay, amazing talk. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Um, my first question is, do you ever miss doing production design? Uh, no, I, I don't know. Design's one of those things that I was always good at, but was never going to be great at. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, like, there are people that I meet who are designers who are great designers and are going to be great designers. Um, I was never that person. Um, I, I liked it, I enjoyed doing it. Um, and then I became a manager and that was like this really weird moment where I was like, that's it. This is the thing I'm good at. Um, it was really weird. It's a really weird uh, feeling. 
to realize that and realize the thing I've been doing for a long time like didn't really wasn't the thing. Um, so yeah, not really. I, I still do side projects at work. Like I have these little, I, I coerce engineers into doing things um, that you know, like building little HR tools and stuff uh, that I'll just you know crank on at night and just like it's just a way to be creative. I think, yeah. but I don't miss it at all. I would never go back. I would prefer to hire designers who are much better than me. <laughs> to, like, That's, to do I the think work. Marco a good VP. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so what is the hardest part of your role currently as VP? Uh, I think, I don't know, I'm trying to think how to describe this. It's very nebulous what I do, and it becomes more nebulous over time. Like that, like that list of things I'm doing, I was doing, that calendar list is so different now than it was then. It just changes all the time. And I would say 50% of it has nothing to do at all with design, like it is, or with the design team specifically. Um, and more and more, I'm trying to lay that responsibility on the design management team um, because they should, they're closer to the metal and they, can, they should be the ones who feel responsible for the team. Um, but that also means like me stepping back, but not so far back that like I disappear either. Um, so I, I've been trying to figure out that balance and that's really difficult um, to do. Yeah, um, so kind of on the same note, what's the most rewarding part? Oh, like I just, I just love when the team does something amazing. It's just like there are these moments where it's like when we shipped solid or like that was really hard and took a long time and took a ton of energy and people and people learning skills they didn't have um, and trying things that were uncomfortable and, and then we did it and it started getting used and that was really magical and I like watching like we just you know yesterday we shipped this you know holiday gift guide and that the design is good the designer's really excited um, we're all excited and proud of her, and it's just like, and everyone rallies around that stuff, and I feel like that's, I don't know, I just really wa like watching the team do things together and do awesome stuff. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Cap.